Thank you very much for coming here. Um, I guess you can hear me. That's good. All right. Um, so um, my name is Fedor. Um, and I'm going to hopefully convince you, or if not convince, share with you my thoughts about um, why I think there is a little more to this AR world than the models and hardware. Um, and it's a lot about the humans. And so why human in loop uh, as a concept is here to stay. Uh, you will be able to ask questions at the end. If you have really pressing question, you can ask it during the presentation, but um, usually it's at the end. Uh, a little bit about me. So I uh, started doing machine learning quite a while back in 2004 um, with some support vector machines where deep learning was not as um, popular. Uh, and then uh, did some theoretical computer science, went to Amazon, Microsoft, um, and then uh, actually started working on uh, human and loop about six years ago. Now uh, running AI and machine learning into locum. And uh, the, the, the plan for the presentation is, is as follows. First, just very brief introduction about um, the human oversight and why you might think you need it or why you might need it in the future. And then uh, given that, okay, we have an assumption that you need it, how do you actually use it? What are the possibilities? Now um, I'm in that section, I'm gonna introduce you to a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of things we do at Toloka and how we use it. And then there's gonna be a section about uh, the industry and research examples of where human oversight um, has been used successfully. Um, as well as there is some um, curious uh, finally, we're going to move to some curious uh, section about uh, human uh, versus humans versus GPTs or humans versus generative models, and uh, uh, we did some small investigation there. So I'm going to share that one with you as well. Well, so first, let's move to the section about uh, whether you need um, oversight or not. And and so what I actually see in the industry is is, is that there is a certain move uh, from okay, well, I'm going to build this model and it's going to do everything for me, I just need to make it a little more accurate on that data set and, and, and I'm gonna be done. So I'm gonna develop that model and then put it in production and, and that's it. Towards, oh, well, you know what? Um, when I develop that model and, and deploy it, I want to make sure that it's still performing right and then I want to like be able to see how it's doing and if it's not me because I don't wanna take care of this myself all the time, maybe I want to hire some experts to check how the model is doing. And, and the reason why kind of this shift is happening is, um, is that after deployment, people notice a few things which they'd like to take care of. And, and one of those is, is data drifts. Uh, and uh, the concept of data drifts is that, you know, you have trained your model, you've tested it on some validation set, bingo, you deployed it. And then, and then it changed, uh, and the model is now not performing as well, and you haven't noticed it because you don't really follow the, the performance of the model all the time. Right? And so another thing is anomalies happen all the time, and um, if you just kind of go to the default performance of the model, you might not handle them properly. There's another reason is, um, actually very practical reason is uh, you get higher accuracy out of a human say, uh, oversight. And, and uh, the way you get it is by rechecking some of the model's predictions when the model is not confident or where the model might be you know, overconfident and from time to time you can recheck the predictions. And as a result, your system together gets higher accuracy. As well as, um, as, well as when you want to handle some maybe important cases for your company. Maybe you want to make sure that uh, you don't get any bias which might have been introduced in your training data. You don't want to um, let it through to your production systems. Or maybe you want um, to somehow during some periods of periods, maybe Christmas and you're selling goods and uh, during that certain period, it's really important for a business because you're making, I don't know, 70% of your revenue at the time. Uh, you are able to pay specific attention to that period uh, with actually interacting, um, interacting with humans. And we had uh, kind of an illustrative example of um, 
of um, a situation which happened to us. So we had a model which was running and, you know, uh, predicting some, well, that was, I think, a sentiment analysis model. Uh, and, um, and, and as you can see in the graph, on the horizontal axis, you have time. On the vertical axis, you have accuracy. And the, uh, every dot is basically a retraining of the model, right? So, so what the system did automatically was, was that it was retraining regularly every once in a while and rechecking its performance, right? And the line is the performance of the best model. So you can see in the beginning, I mean, it's increasing um, the model's learning uh, from one retraining to the next. The more data comes, uh, the more it learns. And then at some point, it stopped learning because, well, there's no more capacity of the model to learn. And you can see the, the line kind of trends downwards a little bit. And the reason why it's doing that is because the, the data uh, is becoming harder um, over time and overall the, the accuracy degrades. But you see what happens a little bit around April, uh, around actually March and April, somewhere, uh, I don't think I have a pointer on that clicker, but anyway, somewhere there. <laughs> what happens is that the line keeps going and the dots are dropping. And the reason for that is that basically we've introduced a bug, uh, unintentional of course, we've introduced a bug in model retraining and then the, every new generation of the models was actually worse. But then, because we didn't know, of course, about that bug, that bug went into production, but the performance of the model was still re-monitored and rechecked, and therefore the model which was in production still followed the pink line, which was that it was still the best model um, uh, so far, rather than being automatically moved to a worse model. And so this is a simple situation where uh, such a system which automatically retrains and re-monitors a model um, was important. And, uh, and, and then you say, well, okay, maybe there is some sort of an illustrative example, but how do, you, how do you make sure, how do you set up such a system? Well, this is what actually Toloka does. And so um, Toloka um, is, is um, a company which helps uh, customers build uh, your own data-driven, data-related or data-driven or data-centric processes across the machine learning lifecycle. And the way it does it is that it has two key parts, uh, data labeling and machine learning, and they're integrating in the loop somehow, right? So you, you have basically, you access the system and inside you have this connection between the two. And, and uh, of course, all of this connection is built on a scalable infrastructure and uh, uh, it's uh, fine-tuning some large models in the background. Um, and um, basically you have this, like, what, what we do inside, we have this infrastructure for the machine learning pipeline, uh, which is ready out of the box for the engineers, for our engineers to use. And um, the reason why we think it's, The reason why we think it's it's really good, uh, it's really good for us that we, we've built this even for our own projects, and we are enabling some parts of this system for others to use, is is because over the period of a few years, actually ten plus years, we've um, collected a lot of expertise on how to run machine learning models, how to do machine learning operations, and how to also work with the humans, and uh, you get basically some state-of-the-art technologies combined with this crowd of people uh, and uh, uh, and the infrastructure. And this can, a mix of these three components makes this makes this work. So let's maybe dive uh, a little bit deeper into how this works on the infrastructure level. But but what's important to notice is 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 that there is this crowd in the middle and and. Uh, it, it's worth stopping uh, and uh, kind of thinking about what what is this crowd about, and and the crowd is is a way of actually connecting uh, connecting tasks which you want people to do to the people who want to do those tasks, and instead of hiring um, uh, uh, some large amount of people and actually paying them regularly. It's a um, free marketplace, you know, free platform for people to come and everybody who has access to the internet can go and come and execute the tasks. And, um, and then whoever wants 
to publish the tasks can publish the tasks, and basically the platform connects these two parts, right? And as a result of this freedom to connect, uh, freedom to come and work, we have um, a performance from performers from uh, 100 plus countries uh, covering 40 plus languages. And you know, if there is a new language which needs to be covered, then just uh, go and you know do a little bit of an ad advertising, and then people come and execute the tasks as long as they're interesting to them and, and uh, pay well. Now, how does um, how does this crowd, how does this human component, how does this connect to the machine learning? Well, uh, the, imagine that you have this, you know, very normal um, pipeline, normal path that you use to build your ML, right? I mean, you, you collect the data, then uh, you label it, you first figure out what, what you need to do with it, maybe you define what your labels are. I mean, you, you say the posit positive sentiment means this, negative sentiment means that, uh, and, and then you label the data, train the model, deploy the model, um, and then verify it and, and, and hopefully monitor it in the background. So what we did was that we took this middle component and abstracted out the operations and, and basically kind of wrapped this into a single API which says, well, as long as you can explain what you want to do with the data, um, you are able to uh, you're able to utilize this infrastructure out of the box. And, and uh, the way it works kind of in the background on the, on the technical side is that there's a hosted model and of course the API towards that hosted model and the database to store the predictions. And that's a normal, I mean, model as a service thing. I mean, it's all fairly old uh, um, concept and uh, you have this in quite a lot of places and, and uh, companies and you can build this. Um, for yourself, it's not very hard. But then what happens is that we also have an additional loop, and you can see there is a Toloka API and there's a Toloka project. So what Toloka API and Toloka projects are, are that basically Toloka API gives you access to this crowd project of, for the humans to execute the tasks. All right? And, and uh, as you can see, Toloka project connects to the crowd and then the crowd puts their labels into the database and there's this, the second loop, there's a loop with a model, there's a loop with a crowd, and as a result from the database, you're able to feed predictions, uh, you feed labels, new labels um, uh, collected from the crowd to the model for monitoring or retraining or you know, basically this continuous, continuous um, interaction with it. Now, uh, if you think about the practical side of it, uh, um, there's basically kind of two extremes. One is you use out-of-the-box model, uh, and, and there's quite a few of them available out there. And the problem uh, with that approach, even though it's probably the cheapest, is that none of them very often fit your system. Um, now, on the other hand, if you take, if you say, I'm gonna build my model myself, and I'm gonna you know, deploy everything myself, it's actually expensive, um, and, and expensive, not only that you need compute, but you also need a lot of expertise for how to train the model, how to handle, um, how to handle uh, machine learning operations, and you, if your company doesn't have this expertise on site, then you actually need to hire the people, and that is also tough. Uh, so this concept which we've built, adaptive models, is somewhere in between the two. Now let's move towards the actual examples of where this could work and where this actually, some of these examples where it actually worked, and some of these examples where it might, where it might work, but also kind of rep, quite representative. Well, first of all, this, this concept of this adaptation uh, out of the box it is quite flexible and can be applied to a variety of different industries and a variety of different use cases. Uh, here I list some, you know, maybe relevant for e-commerce like uh, image and text moderation or search relevance or, you know, speech to text um, applications and a lot of others. And so probably the content moderation is one of the most, one of the easiest to explain. And, and the way it works is um, that, you know, you have, uh, you have, um, we actually, we actually had this use case in production. You have a collection of messages from different people and you're trying to control how the quality of the messages on your platform. 
And if you have a platform where people can message each other, then what you end up having is some bots or some people who have malicious intent or just people who are trying to talk about some things which maybe are illegal. And you better filter those out because that raises the quality of your platform and of course that influences your attention. And uh, the way the system worked was uh, that we had, we had this model in the background. I mean, I'm going to be explaining, you don't need to get into every single part of this, but basically we had a model in the background which was trained to recognize some malicious intent or some you know, bad examples which you'd like to filter out. But uh, as you can imagine, the majority of the messages are actually good, right? So the majority of the messages uh, uh, you can trust and you better release them fast so that you know users can freely communicate. Now, when the model thinks that the message is not um, safe, then uh, you can immediately remove it from the platform, but you might get complaints from the user. So what happened was that we covered two different areas of um, the spectrum from the model is confident that it's a good message for, to the model is confident it's a bad message. We covered, we covered two parts of the spectrum with some amount of human relabeling. Right? When the model is not very confident whether it's bad or good message, you could actually send this to humans and therefore improve the accuracy for, this part, for these messages where you're not very confident. And for the messages where the model is confident it's bad, you can sometimes relabel some random proportions of them and actually recheck how good the model is and actually find out some you know, weak parts where the model doesn't perform very well. And so this is why like this, like covering these two areas, this is, um, this is why it can brought us this effect of, uh, of uh, bringing higher quality uh, moderation to, uh, to the customer. Um, basically you get Bes now, besides, what, what I didn't cover, I guess, in, 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 in my little speech about this particular example is that besides the middle part where, you know, the model is not confident, you might have a lot of different classes which are just really hard to discover. And one of the things which um, uh, I'm sure in Europe's uh, audience and <laughs> understands very well is that machine learning is about statistics and a very few things work out of the box for new classes and the zero shot, uh, however good that is, quite often is not, um, the performance of the zero shot models quite often is not enough for production. And so long story short, you need quite a few examples of every class in order for your model to perform well. And so if you don't have those examples, this combination of ML and a model, uh, of ML and uh, humans provides you a better performance. So having these, humans covered classes where uh, you don't have enough examples is, is quite often a strategy for handling this. Now another good example is um, uh, the example of um, the uh, recognition of documents, right? You have a document and you're trying to find out where in that document certain fields are and what is in those fields, right? And so there's kind of roughly speaking two parts of it, uh, two parts in that system, one is um, uh, the part which finds where the necessary fields are, and another one is actually the part which recognizes uh, which numbers or which letters are in the section. And, and both of these you can say, well, I can have a model for detection and I have, can have a model for recognition, but it turns out for the production use case it's not enough to have um, only the models for every one of these parts, and it's much better yet again to have a human loop system where, um, let's say you have a model which found some bounty boxes on an image and when you're trying to tune a production system, very often uh, these models which find bounding boxes on an image, you're trying to tune that model in a way that it finds too many bounding boxes intentionally so that it doesn't miss any and you don't have to send every single image uh, to, to the humans. Now, now it found too many bounding boxes, a little too many, and then you can have some sort of verification, and maybe you can have even a, you know, a discriminator which says, oh, 
did this model find the right, uh, the right bounding box or not? But quite often, this discriminator, again, is a part of the model which actually finds your bounding boxes. So if you see that you don't get enough accuracy, just putting one model over another might not be <laughs> the best way you go about it. Uh, and a way to go about this is, can be that you actually send uh, this bounding box, some of these bounding boxes to humans and verify that, you know, whatever the model found is, is correct. So instead of asking humans to draw the bounding box around every single um, part of the image where um, the fields are, right, about outlining basically every single part, you just ask humans, hey, like, this is bounding box. Is this the right one or not? And, and clicking yes or no is, is really fast and you can make it cheap and scalable and uh, a very, very efficient process of checking what the model has done. Now the same thing, um, kind of similar uh, process happens with the recognition part. Right? I mean, the model recognizes letters, but the thing is if you want to recognize a whole word or letter by letter, the model might not be confident about some of these numbers uh, which it found and then again, if the model, maybe the aggregate confidence of the model is not high enough, and you can send that to the humans for verification. And, uh, and I guess summarizing why for this example, it was uh, important to have this human oversight was because, um, because overall accuracy metrics have been improved and then you actually have better detection as well. Um, accuracy of recognition, accuracy of detection uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, you can verify over time if your types of documents change, you have some sort of data drift, uh, then you can capture it. Now a similar situation, um, a similar kind of use case um, we've, um, we've done was uh, with the social media mentioning classification. And this use case demonstrates why you don't want to just have one model built and then forget about it. And, and the, um, the company which approached this actually had their own model which was built about a year ago for classifying social media into those which are relevant to them or not relevant, uh, relevant to their business or not relevant to their business. And uh, uh, they were sending about 19,000 items a day to relabel because the model was not confident about them. And then when you had a model, when we did this little integration with the adaptation in the background, they started spending uh, only half as much as they used to spend. And the reason is that when the model is more modern, it's a very obvious thought uh, kind of idea. Um, I suppose that you know, when you have a more modern model, more updated, it actually performs better. But what's impressive about it is how much better, how much better it could perform. Right? Because I mean, spending half the price uh, because you updated the model can be quite a significant um, change for for the finances. Uh, now the. Um, uh, another use case is, is uh, also quite practical, but similar to this social media classification, was that a lot of people try to use maybe rules, or there are a lot of um, there are a few companies right now who are helping you with uh, labeling the data using rules. And then uh, the way the rules work is that you you have a million data points, and then you try to filter them out into a thousand data points using those rules, and then to those thousand you apply human over like human oversight or human labeling, and uh, and now you know something about this one thousand data points. But of course, the problem with this is that you don't know much about the rest uh, nine hundred ninety nine thousand uh, data points. And and so if you take a model and host a model, just you know not limiting yourself to only the human part, with, by doing this integration with human in the model, you're actually able to cover many more items and get much more information, which is useful. Now, I mean, the, the reason why I think don't need to go <laughs> through this again, the reason why human si oversight was important here, and, and in this example is combination, rather like why machine learning was important here, but uh, as I mentioned, pure machine learning is not going to make a cut. So um, 
is because of the accuracy increase uh, for the parts where the model is not confident, as well as for some fine grained classification of the classes where the model just didn't know much at all or we didn't have training data. Now another interesting use case, and, and that, that use case is similar to, uh, to the use case with the document recognition, was actually finding, finding missing people. Uh, and there is this company which uh, is a uh, non-profit company which is uh, um, using drones and helicopter pictures, images, to find people who might be missing in forests or some remote areas. In order to do that, I mean, they have these insanely similar images and uh, <laughs> insane amount of those similar images. And, and to find those, you know, to find some humans there, is, it's, it's usually really hard. So you say, well, how do I scale? Um, then again, I mean, you, you don't want to hire a team of people who just like look at those images and trying to, uh, with the red eyes during the nights, trying to find those um, th those people on the on those videos. What you do is that you build a machine learning model, and, and bingo, it's going to find something, but maybe it's not. Uh, and, uh, and then again, you end up in the in the same situation I described for document recognition, right? You have these um, models which are performing, uh, which are finding a lot of bounding boxes, but they're finding a lot of false positives. And, and again, for production, you're tuning those models to find a lot of potential boxes so that you don't miss the people who might be missing. Uh, and uh, to verify those boxes, you can use some human feedback. That's exactly what happened here. Um, and I don't need to go to the same, <laughs> the same uh, arguments, but... Uh, Basically, with, again, with the image recognition, the key thought I want you to kind of think about here is that when you tune the models to have a lot of false positive, verifying those false positive with humans is, is, is what, makes, um, what makes really kind of reliable results. Now, um, so these were production use cases for, for actually industry clients. Uh, and then if we move towards uh, the academic world of 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 uh, where the human help might be or human labeling might be useful uh, and and uh, this is where we're mo moving in and I want to start with a use case where we actually labeled um, audio transcriptions uh, and uh, uh, the problem of course was that there's a lot of um, complex audios with, and you'd like, you're trying to train models which transcribe audio from the audio to text. And uh, it's hard. Uh, sometimes there's a lot of noise in the audio. Sometimes it's just you know very low volume uh, for the model to catch. And then uh, you're saying, well, how about I go and ask humans to actually transcribe it? And of course, there are cases where humans cannot transcribe it. but there's still many more cases where human can transcribe it and the model cannot. And um, so we've collected this data set of, um, of the transcriptions. However, one of the things which is actually challenging with transcriptions and with asking humans to do those transcriptions is that the human um, looks at the audio and, and then they write what they think they hear and then another person can look at the same audio and write what they here, and these two things might be different from each other. And so what you need to do is you, you actually need aggregation of those transcriptions received from different individuals uh, as a way of actually getting higher accuracy of the transcriptions. And uh, we've released the data set of these noisy transcriptions and tested, uh, tested different aggregation methods. And what, what is an aggregation method? Well, basically, in an aggregation method in this case is a method which takes um, a few texts as input and, and, and returns one text as the output. And uh, so we've tested a few methods on that data set, found out that you know, T5 is uh, pretty good. Um, but um, this is word error rate. Uh, so less, is, less is better. Uh, uh, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is that 
here, uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that the um, transcriptions can be quite hard uh, for the model to be done, and then you're trying to address maybe uh, this transcription with humans, and then there's a different challenge which you're facing is the aggregation of those transcriptions done by different humans. And uh, so, oh, by the way, yeah, the, the code for this case is open sourced and uh, uh, the whole data set is open sourced as well. The code for receiving, the, for obtaining that data set and then for the aggregation. Now there is another interesting area which where, where people end up still using um, human feedback is the area of learning from subjective data or just handling subjective data, right? And, and the task was to say, well, let's say you have a task which is which person is older on an image, like from, from an image you have a task of saying which person um, is older and which person is, is younger. And basically just kind of trying to at least guess some sort of age for, for the people, right? Um, and so the, a way to do that could be to collect a lot of pairwise comparisons for the, uh, a lot of pairwise comparisons between different images of people and, uh, and say, you know, which one is, which one, which one of these two humans is older, which one is not. And so as a result, you can actually rank uh, the ages of, rank the images according to their perceived age and uh, somehow guess the age. Um, and, and, and they demonstrate that like what this example, this particular example demonstrates is, is the ability to rank items um, not necessarily with the model which, which was trained to rank those items but with a, a collection of pairwise comparisons die by, done by human experts. Now a similar curious example is this example of crowd clustering and, and uh, and the example of cloud clustering tells us about, again, comparison, subjective comparison between items where you don't know the distance metric. So, you know, you have uh, dresses and, and you're trying to figure out which dresses are similar to some other dresses and saying, well, you know, I don't know, like, I don't know what's, like, how do you determine the distance? Yeah, well, you train a ResNet and you do, a, uh, you do an embedding and, uh, and then you have a Euclidean distance. That's, you know, that's an approach of a, a machine learning person, right? Uh, but but this, uh, this might not really reflect what people think uh, about similarity of, of those dresses. And that's, that's a key problem with, with this kind of approaches, right? So what you could do is that you could actually, again, you could take, um, the dress images of the dresses and then say hey, you know which which of these dresses is similar to the key like template dress right and and people can say uh, rank the dresses according to the similarity and then using that you can transform this to the distance metric and actually cluster the uh, cluster the dresses using this subjective distance metric and then again, I mean, I don't need to explain uh, why, why human oversight is, is important here, but uh, I do want to come back to the topic of subjectivity, right? Is, is when you have a subjective, when you're trying to determine certain subjective relationships which only, uh, which are only, where the truth is only kind of perceived from the humans, this is where you're trying to say, well, how do I get this perceived truth? And, uh, uh, and, and, and the way to get it is you run a very large collection, large audience, and you ask them, you know, what's, what's your opinion? Uh, and then you do some sort of smart methods for actually aggregating them, clustering or ranking as before. Now, there is another curious application which, which we have done is reinforcement learning with human feedback. Basically, I mean, many of you know about reinforcement learning. You, you have an agent which is trying to operate in a certain environment, right? Uh, and the uh, environment at some point gives you, somewhere at the end uh, of your lifetime, gives you, <laughs> gives you a score of how well you've done. Um, and uh, basically, you try to do you know, the, the better you could, the, the best you could. And, and so you're trying to um, build a system, build an algorithm which 
performs well in you know such environments. Uh, games are probably uh, the most uh, um, the simplest example. Now the the problem with this uh, with this area can be that designing the reward function is hard. I mean, how do you know that you're doing good, or how do you know that you're you know you're not doing good? And and so like what's what's good and what is not good? All these philosophical questions. Uh, all these philosophical questions can be asked about life, but even in when you're trying to develop an algorithm uh, for reinforcement learning, uh, the question of how do you design a reward function is quite important. And so what we did was that basically we said, look, I mean we're not going to design a reward function. We're going to do side by side comparison um, and uh, send these uh, pairs of uh, pairs of states of the agent to the humans to perceive and say, is this you know which one of these two states is better, right? And by by having these pair collection of these pairwise comparisons, uh, it turns out you can train. Oh, there's no video here, but work well. There's a video on our website, but it turns out you can train the agent to do a backup. This is the OpenAI um, reinforcement learning playground uh, where, and what we try to do is that we try to make this a little hammer-ish thingy to do a backflip. And so with these pairwise comparisons and, and basically ranking, you, using the reward from these pairwise Using designing a reward function in a way that it takes care of, the, uh, it incorporates these pairwise comparisons. You're able to do this backflip uh, of the agent, and 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 then again. So what what here the humor oversight oversight tells us is that when you don't know how to design a reward function, but you know how to compare two states, you are able to you you are able to design the reward function by well, sending these little comparisons to the human judges. Now, this is a more um, interesting, recent kind of example of uh, best uh, prompts for text-to-image models. And that's like we actually have a workshop if you're staying here until the third. I'm going to talk a little more about that um, later on, on Sunday. Uh, but basically, the question you have here is, you have all this great stability AI and other, you know, diffusion models which generate images, and uh, uh, you can uh, generate wonderful, um, uh, wonderful cartoon images of yourself, or 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 just on any any new topic, you can generate some you know, pretty cool, almost realistically looking images, and then. You, but, but, but in order to actually generate them, you, you need a prompt. You need to know what you're trying to generate. And as a person, you're saying, well, I, I just want to generate, you know, a port of painting of, oh, well, Daenerys Targaryen Queen. <laughs> and maybe, you, you know this, but, but what you're going to get is actually a very bad image. And then you're, you're wondering, how do you, how does, how do these authors of the really cool pictures generate those cool pictures? And, and, and the answer is, they find a good prompt. Uh, so it turns out that it's not enough to just tell the uh, tell the model what you want to be generated. You need some magical words around, like you know, dramatic lighting or <laughs> trending on art station, something like that, uh, in order for your image to look good. And finding those magical words is hard. And so, well, what would, what would you do? You know, imagine you, you have the system, you don't actually have to imagine, you can just go on a, on a website and <laughs> you know, uh, find those uh, systems that generate uh, images, right? So you have those um, uh, systems that generate images, you're trying to find a good prompt to generate the images, but you're not able to do that, and, and what do you do? I mean, you go to the top key prompts, top keywords which people use, and just try to use them, and it turns out that that might not really be the best approach. Uh, and so our approach uses, as you could have guessed, side-by-side uh, -side comparison here with human uh, feedback. And uh, the way we did was, was a genetic algorithm which actually was trying to find which, prompts is, which prompt is the best. And we were trying to find a collection of prompts which is, which is 
generating best images. So it's not like for every image we were trying to find a prompt. We were trying to find a, a collection of the keywords which is good for all sorts of different images. And so we've um, designed this genetic algorithm which, uh, ev which ran a few evolutions of the population of keywords uh, with the side-by-side -side comparison between humans. I'm not going to get too deep into this, but visually the results are better than if you just used top keywords. Now, finally, I'm getting to the part where maybe the generative models are still going to be able to beat all the human results. And uh, so we, we have this, uh, we've ran this small experiment where, um, where um, we took the IMDb movie reviews data set and uh, tried to do some simple binary classification and took an open source GPTJ model and turns out it's actually doing almost the same as humans. So then I guess the human oversight is not needed. So it's the end of my presentation. Uh, well, actually not, not really. Well, as soon as you go to, uh, to a more complex task or a slightly different task, uh, was a product classification task. Again, it was binary, but it was a data set of somewhat more complex images than the IMDb reviews. And uh, the GPTJ accuracy was drastically worse than the accuracy of humans. However, the GPT-3 accuracy was actually quite similar to the human performance. And uh, we don't have a, you know, a conclusive evidence to, to say which one is going to win in the long run. But, uh, but an idea that probably a combination of those two might be a way to go. Uh, and uh, well, it turns out that the humans are, um, can, can offer you some feedback on maybe your instructions in the, in the project or you know, whether these instructions are good or not good, whether they are understandable or not understandable. And the models can maybe classify data better than humans quite often. Uh, but they don't give you yet constructive feedback about how to improve your task or how to make it more clear. So some sort of different creative combinations you can go. Now coming to the conclusion, uh, coming to the conclusion, I want to come back to, to the image I showed you where um, we were trying to say that, look, the, you, you don't rely on just ML forever and you probably won't rely on humans, uh, on human feedback forever. And it's some sort of a combination of those two which quite often wins and just makes interesting, useful results in both production, industry, and academic settings. The reason, the reasons, I'd say, for this combination often come from trying to handle data drifts, anomalies, uh, trying to improve scalability, and uh, trying to improve accuracy, as well as for, as long as we want to handle some specific areas like bias or some dangerous, some important periods of the model's performance. Now, there is this, this automatic way of doing this combination of machine learning and humans, which I talked about. It's kind of in beta right now. So if you're curious about giving some feedback, feel free to, or trying to play with it. But uh, overall, I'm done for, the, for this talk. So thank you very much for listening. Hopefully it was interesting and uh, feel free to ask any questions.